while we shift very quickly, but I hope adroitly, to our second topic, which is a really, really, really short history of nearly everything. Now, a few years ago, you, as you may know, I wrote a book called The Short History of Nearly Everything, which was my attempt to understand the world and the universe around it and how they got, both got to be the way they are. Or as I put it in the book, how we went from there being nothing at all to there being something, and then how a little of that something eventually turned into us. Now, one of the things that particularly fascinated me was how scientists figured things out. How did they know where the continents were 300 million years ago? Or how hot it is on the surface of the sun? Or what goes on at the heart of a gene? Or what was happening in the universe in its first three minutes? How did they even know that the universe had a first three minutes and hasn't just been there forever? How does anybody ever figure these things out? And so the book became for me a kind of quest to find out not only what we know, but how we know what we know. And so for about four years, I did almost nothing but try to understand science and its achievements. I traveled to 11 countries on five continents, read lots and lots of books and journals and transcripts and monographs, and asked enormous amounts of really dumb questions of incredibly kind and patient experts from a variety of disciplines. I didn't have any particular outcome in mind, no ax to grind or anything like that. I was just trying to pack an empty mind with as much interesting information as it could hold. But in doing the book, I found myself being drawn, again and, being drawn again and again to certain inescapable conclusions about the universe and we live in it and our part in it, including four really remarkable facts. I think they may be the four most remarkable facts there are, and I would like to share those with you briefly now. So here, without ado, they are the four most remarkable facts I know. First, you exist. You're alive. That's really quite a marvelous thing to be able to say when you stop and think about it. For you to be here now, trillions and trillions of drifting atoms had somehow to come together to make you. In the whole history of the universe, atoms have never got together quite this way before, and they never will again. These atoms came to Earth from all over. They could be anything. But for some reason, they've decided for a few tens of years to be you. That's pretty extraordinary, if you ask me. Now, why atoms do this is a puzzle. Being you is not a gratifying experience for the atom. <laughs> An atom doesn't even know you're there. It doesn't even know it's there. Atoms are mindless particles. They, after all, they don't know a thing. Yet somehow, for the length of your existence, these tiny devoted particles will engage in all the delicate cooperative efforts necessary to keep you humming, to make you you, to give you form and shape, and let you enjoy this, the rare and supremely agreeable condition known as life. Now, this is really hard to explain because there's nothing special about the atoms that make you. A human being or any other living thing is an assortment of almost embarrassingly mundane components, principally carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. This is the same stuff you would find in a pile of dirt. The only thing special about the atoms that make you is that they make you. That is, of course, the miracle of life. But having obliging atoms is only part of the good fortune that got you here to the Guild Hall on quite a lovely evening in 2010. You've also been incredibly lucky genealogically, ancestrally. Statistically speaking, you shouldn't be here. None of us should. Survival on Earth is surprisingly hard work. It is a curious fact of our existence that we come from a planet that is very good at producing life, but even better at extinguishing it. Of all the billions of species of organism that have sprung up and existed on Earth in its long productive history, 99.99% are no longer here. They're gone, gone forever. The remarkable fact is that the normal condition for a species on Earth is to be extinct. The average species on this planet lasts for only about four million years. If you wish to last longer, as we most assuredly do, then you must continually recreate yourself. You must be prepared to change everything that defines you shape, size, color, physiology, diet, metabolism, everything, and to do so repeatedly in the right sequence of precisely the right historical moments. For us to be here now, it has been necessary for our ancestors to make all kinds of wholesale adjustments, all of them random, none of them inevitable or even necessarily logical, but every one of them necessary to get us here today. So we've been very lucky in that way too. But even that's not enough. You've also got nearly four billion years of reproductive good fortune behind you as an individual. Consider the fact that for you to be here now, every one of your ancestors on both sides since the dawn of time has been attractive enough to find a mate, robust enough to reproduce, and sufficiently blessed by fate and circumstance to live long enough to do so. Not one of your forebears in nearly four billion years on either side 
was squashed, devoured, stranded, starved, stuck fast, pipped by a more glamorous suitor, spurned or otherwise deflected from its life's quest of delivering the tiny charge of genetic material to the right partner at the right moment to perpetuate the only possible sequence of hereditary combinations that could result eventually, astoundingly, and all too briefly in you. I don't wish to belabor the point, but life is a damn lucky thing when you stop to think about it. Your existence is a miracle, and you really shouldn't let a day pass that you don't rejoice in having it. Which brings me to my second amazing fact. Life doesn't happen anywhere else in the universe, as far as we know. Now, that really is odd. The atoms that so freely and congenially clump together to form living things on Earth seem entirely disinclined to do, it else, do so elsewhere. Of course, the evidence isn't all in yet. So far, astronomers have found only a few dozen or so planets beyond our own solar system out of the 10 billion trillion or so that are thought to exist. So we can hardly claim to have scoured every corner of the universe. But it is certainly the case that the only life that has turned up so far, and very possibly ever will, is found on this one single unprepossessing blue planet in a nameless solar system two-thirds of the way out from the center of the Milky Way. And that's not much in a great big universe, particularly when you consider that all that life on that small blue planet is found almost exclusively in a frail wisp of water and atmosphere around the surface. If you imagine the Earth shrunk down to the size of a standard desktop globe, then the atmosphere is only about the thickness of two coats of varnish. And the part of that atmosphere that supports life, the biosphere as it is known, is only a small part of that. Most of the Earth is too cold or dry or lofty and thin-aired for most types of life. Humans, even with the advantage of clothing and shelter, can manage to live on only about 12% of Earth's landscape. Other animals are restricted further still. In consequence, most of Earth's life is confined to an exceedingly modest range. Just 1.4% of Earth's land area contains more than half its biodiversity. I can't think of a better reason than that to be worried about global warming. Which brings me to my third and penultimate amazing fact, that we live on a planet that we don't really know. There may be no other detectable life in the universe, but there is such an abundance of it here on our own planet that we don't actually know how much there is. We don't even remotely know. I find that quite amazing. Even more amazing, we don't even know what we know. No one has ever managed to collate the total number of known living things on the planet. Most estimates for the number of named species of living things put, a, put it at a figure of about one and a half million, but that's really only a guess. As for the number of unnamed, yet to be identified species of living things, we are even more clueless. It may be tens of millions, it may be hundreds of millions. But according to one extraordinary estimate, perhaps as much as 97% of all that lives on the Earth and in the seas is still to be discovered. 